Hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever in the world you happen to be. It's Crow Ravel. Uh, Wallet text behind me, so, yep, it's going to be a guide uh, about FTL. Uh, and this one's just entitled, Not Losing in FTL. I've decided to delve into some philosophical elements of FTL playing. At some point, most players hit a wall in which they no longer improve. FTL is not unique in this manner, and I understand that many players simply wish to not explore further into FTL tactics and strategies. You know, find your happy place. But if you are a player who feels stuck, that tutorials, live streams, and guides just aren't moving the needle, then perhaps this video may be of assistance. The first thing I want to address really is just the law of diminishing returns. Learning to upgrade shields early, targeting enemy weapons, and maximizing jumps are early lessons that can show dramatic improvements in win rates. But as one climbs the ladder towards a higher win rate, the gap between the rungs gets smaller, and one has to invest more time to gain smaller benefits. Benefits that may not even show up in one per hundred runs, perhaps even less. One has to learn a lot of little lessons to see major improvements, so try not to be discouraged when it feels like you aren't making progress. Um, I'm just going to kind of hit these, expand on, on bullet points of errors and approaches to FTL. Uh, the first being overstating positives. One of the common mistakes I find is players state that they have a reason to do something, so it has to be a good idea. Buying piloting level 2 provides a blue option. Hacking shields can give the player the opportunity of inflicting the most amount of damage, and diving yields more scrap. And in most cases, what the players are proclaiming is not inaccurate. However, FTL isn't about having a reason to do something. It's more about having a reason to not do something. Buying piloting for an event, you have no guarantee of finding and still only 20% success or an 80% success rate if the option's there. Means you are 20 scrap less when going to a store. Hacking shields does not reduce enemy evasions in the slightest, nor does it stop their weapons from firing. And some deft evasion from the AI, and one can find themselves in a world of hurt. And diving means facing an elite ship, which in Sector 1, for example, can have two shields, five power and weapons, as well as an ASB. This is a considerable step up in risk versus the ships one would normally see in that sector. To me, if something risks death, or at the very least, exceedingly high chance of death, I simply don't do it. On one hand, a lot of early fights can pose a risk. If the player misses too many shots, if the player's key systems are hit, but diving into an elite, for an example, is just a different matter in terms of risk. You win runs by surviving encounters through the lessening of risk, which is aided by using correct strategies. Generally speaking, players have adopted several strategies in which they overstate the positives and or downplay or outright ignore the negatives. Uh, so I would just go into a side. Conversations that I have tend to break down into this is their strategy and this is my strategy. They're like, this is why I do it. And then I go, well, I think there's some things that are wrong with that strategy. And here's a better strategy that doesn't have those risks. And the player will go, yeah, but my risks aren't that bad. And I don't like your strategy because I'm not comfortable with it. And so they just kind of stay here. Okay. As I said, these calculated risks may only kill a player 2% of the time in a run. And it's a risk that they might not even take every run. However, a mixture of six, seven, eight calculated risk, each with, you know, a one to 3% chance of costing a run will get you killed on a fairly consistent basis. 
On average, a player visits 100 beacons, fights 40 some ships. Low chance events are going to happen every run. It's better to live and fight again than risk the run in total. Now, there are different situations in which no one actually knows which risk is greater. Floating 12 scrap on rock A in like sector one means you can sell whole missile and rock plating to afford a teleporter, but it does mean that you are going to delay your shields. So what is the greater risk? The lack of a shield buffer or shield bubble two or not finding an offensive alternative before running out of missiles? I haven't the faintest idea. Uh, but I lean towards floating the 12 scrap in the hopes the two buffer points to protect my Artemis is better. I mean, there's, like I said, there's rationale for both of those things, but you know, you try and find which one assumes the least amount of risk. You do have to be careful though. Focusing solely on negative outcomes can also be an issue. Fearing all your shots are going to miss or being scared that every enemy shot is going to start a fire can lead to additional stress as well as decision paralysis. A balance is to be struck. In the end, a player must be honest with their analysis. FTL doesn't care how much you want to believe your strategy is correct. And those mistakes will eventually catch up to you. Overstating bad RNG. Now, make no mistake, there is a lot of RNG, random number generator, within FTL. Some runs are cakewalks, others are slogs, and sometimes, rarely, they are unwinnable. I have a 96.5% win rate in my last 320 runs, about 11 losses. Hollow Shadime has a 97% win rate in his last 200 runs, if I recall the sh his statistics correctly. And Mike Copley has a stated win rate of about 98% over the last couple of years, not counting his shieldless runs. I think it is more than fair to say that forced losses represent 3% of FTL runs at most. Players armed with this information will still regularly point to RNG for being the cause of their loss, far exceeding the 3% of runs. At times, it is incredibly difficult to perceive moments in which the player erred and is far easier to note when the game is being particularly nasty. A player using less than ideal strategies invites preventable bad RNG, and I think players get stuck confusing preventable bad RNG with forced losses. Those calculated risks that result in bad outcomes is not bad RNG because it could have been prevented by a better strategy. In most runs, I spend my first like 20 scrap as a buffer in shields to prevent death spirals. There probably should be shields there. A lot of the time though, that doesn't do anything, okay? Either I don't get hit in shield, I take out the enemy offense, or the damage was unpreventable in some way, like a missile or whatever. I don't have any hard numbers here, but perhaps 95% of the time, the buffer by itself provided no benefit. Perhaps 3% of the time it saved a damage or two, but 2% of the time, the buffer saved a run, right? You got hit in the shields in an asteroid field. You got hit in the shields in a solar flare against a drone co or a combat one against a beam drone and it saves the run. And like I said, that's my approach to FTL, okay? Have a general idea of what can kill you and find a solution. 
approaching decisions with a caveat of, well, it's unlikely to kill me, is going to hold you back. Micro. Hollow Shadime is a no-pause player of well-deserved renown for his own streaks of over 100 wins and having nearly as many cycles as the rest of the FTL community combined. One thing I have found interesting is people regard his high level of micro as a large part of his success. And I do not deny his impressive ability to mobilize crew, target enemy systems, and swap power without the use of pause. But a pause player can easily do the same with an even higher level of accuracy and precision. And yet, not all pause players are winning 95% of the time. And that's because good micro is nothing without good strategy. An example of this is dealing with borders. When dealing with event borders, so there's no enemy ship, ship in this in our little example here, players can vent their entire ship, save the med bay, and force the borders to fight in ideal terms. This micro involves moving the crew quickly, turning off O2, powering the med bay, and opening the relevant doors. And this is exceptionally easy to do in pause, but requires a little bit more finesse in no pause to prevent, say, system damage. However, if you were to use this strategy while an enemy ship is present, a hit to your weapons, O2, or med bay could create a dire situation. No amount of execution in the aforementioned strategy will alter this. Instead, players will need new strategies like tactical venting, aided by manning doors or upgrading doors, exploitation of AI's prioritizations, etc. And these strategies may require more micro, and these strategies also change on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the threat of the enemy ship, the player's crew, where the borders spawn, etc. That's going to be the last time I use etc. A player of Hollow's caliber excels because they employ the best strategy for those situations. And yes, they execute at a high level, but you need the strategy first. Now, there are certainly limitations on how much micro a player can perform, either due to not using pause or being overwhelmed what's happening even with the use of pause. Upgrading doors or swapping to a clone bay can aid players in lessening micro required for dealing with borders, but it's at the cost of scrap, which can impact overall strategy. That's opportunity cost for you. The same could be said about upgrading one's reactor, as having more reactor lessens the need to reallocate power during a fight. Again, at the cost of scrap. Optimally, players should not use these aids because micro can produce the same results without the need of resources. While using such aids can improve overall win rate, these are still less than ideal strategies and will result in, a, in lowering your win rate potential. Overly biased. People have the weapons and augments that they like or love, and more importantly, ones that they don't. I've never understood the dislike some have towards Charge Laser 1. You know, it doesn't start fires like Burst 1, it's a little slower, but to me, it is two shots for two power for 55 scrap, and that's a solid weapon most of the time. When someone loses a run and complains about not finding any good weapons, I ask two questions. Firstly, did you visit enough stores? And secondly, did they pass on valid weapons? Missiles aren't ideal, but can work to kill rooms while ignoring shields. Ion weapons don't deal damage, but dropping a shield bubble can help. You can even rent a weapon as well, just to tide you over until you find a better late-game item. 
Two shielded ships are common in Sector 3. Three shielded ships start showing up in Sector 4. And it's better to have a weak option that lets you kill enemy ships, or at the very least help keep you alive, than to have no option. Running before walking in FTL. Uh, so in early sectors of FTL, these are the most dangerous sectors to the player. If a player earns a free weapon or is getting above average crap, sometimes they upgrade their weapons far earlier than required. A strong sector one can easily be followed by a trash sector two and three, and all that scrap that was burning a hole in your pockets earlier is nowhere to be seen, and players can fall behind. Think of this sort of like chasing value. Buying NG is great, but it's not needed outside of Mantis B. Getting five projectiles is great, but not necessary against one shielded ships. While sometimes a player can use overwhelming offense to make up for a lack of systems, not leaning into offense of too early will hopefully allow players the scrap to buy key systems. After I equalize a ship, normally this is like by upgrading shields or a buffer in weapons, I try to find a weapon and then hacking. Hacking. And all I'm really trying to say though is don't rush to get weapons online if you don't necessarily need it. And to give yourself a chance of buying something like hacking or like mind control. And then if no hacking is available and you actually need the weapons, then sure, get it online. But as I said, rushing to get a weapon that you don't really need yet can result in, as I said, falling behind and potentially losing runs. <sighs> Overly emotional. And FTL? FTL can be brutal. And a nasty fight or a slog of a run or two or three slogs of runs in a row can tilt the best of us. And I'm not going to say don't tilt. Instead, uh, find a way to deal with tilt. Personally, I had noticed that when I was tilting, I would, you know, kind of like sit forward, get myopic, pause less, and rush micro as if that was going to make the situation better. Now when I start tilt, uh, tilting, I pause the game and I sit back in my chair. The change of posture breaks my body's habit so I can imprint a new response. By backing away, my gaze widens, ensuring that I'm paying attention to everything and not becoming hyper-focused on one element. And by taking a pause, I hope to ensure that I carefully consider everything I need to do versus rushing to make a decision. Being overly speedy. I don't have that problem. Uh, I've seen several players who focus too much on speed. They don't want their runs to take too long. I've, I don't get it because a, a victory in two hours is worth as, just as much as a victory that takes five. And one shouldn't become impatient to the point their play suffers. Players who skip crew kills because they take too long miss chances to get free weapons or more scrap, thus hindering their chances at victory. And if you're win streaking, a loss is far more devastating in terms of costing time than anything else. Winning 15 times in a row, rush a fight, you hack the wrong system and you die, and those 15 wins, the time you spent on them, are gone. So 30 plus hours lost because you couldn't wait 30 seconds. Focusing on speed also adds stress to the player as if FTL wasn't providing enough of that. Take it easy on yourself. Don't make FTL harder than it already is. 
by adding additional parameters of needing to finish your runs in a certain amount of time. Conclusion, that ends strong. <sighs> Look, I know these things, the things we talked above, because I've done them. I mean, not, not the speed thing, obviously, but everything else, yeah, yeah. There have been several players who have helped me to improve by either providing guides or reviewing my runs. Thomas Peterson has pointed out multiple faults in my game. Thanks, Thomas. I had died on Kestrel A. This is, I think I had lost like four different times, four times in a row on four different layouts. And instead of jumping away, my FTL, I, yeah, I'm sorry. So I died on Kestrel A instead of jumping away after my FTL had charged. I was mad. I was mad at the enemy ship. And I thought, I'm so good at FTL. I win all the fights and that's how you win because you get scrap. So I opted to just sit there and die. Once in Sector 2, Zoltan Border Police put three crew into my NGA's engines and MC'd the crew there. Did I mention they also had an Artemis and a Heavy Laser 1? Artemis into shields, started a fire, and I died. <laughs> what terrible, terrible RNG, right? But Thomas pointed out that I skipped a store. I had spent 20 scrap on piloting because there were two or three nebula jumps. And it just, I didn't get anything for, for it. And yeah, I just bypassed the store because I didn't have money for what I thought would be something that could improve my run. I mean, maybe that store sucks. It's possible. Or maybe I find a weapon or something that could have helped. Uh, it's actually at this point where I basically stopped getting the piloting upgrade. Because as I said, if it's costing me runs, I don't want it. Just get rid of it. Uh, and I honestly have never really felt bad about it since. And there yeah, definitely have been runs where I, you know, could have gotten two, three high-end rewards from the piloting but like that's just it's a risk management assessment where i just rather have the money and buy buy something than to chance of a chance of a chance and uh well i don't know i mean i do know I win 95% of the time, but I didn't get there by myself. I don't think anybody does without outside help. And it's actually one of the reasons like I like making guides. Uh, so don't, don't take this video as me calling everybody out on their poor decisions while inferring. I never made mistakes. I still make mistakes. Every run I make mistakes. I'm merely reflecting on observations of common issues among FTL players. Players want their decisions to be correct, so of course they hype the positives, and how when they lose, they get really irked by that bad RNG they just ignored. And Amazing Micro, particularly in no pause, is very easy to see, but don't be so blinded by it that you ignore the underlying rationale of why the player is even using it. Emotions can cloud our judgments, whether it's anger or rushing decisions that lead to mistakes you wouldn't normally make, or just ignoring a viable weapon you desperately need because it wasn't the one you wanted. Like I said, FTL is a brutal game, um, but you try to, or you could, you should, try and get better every run. Try to find new different ways to improve your game. And I kind of hope that's what this video does is it provides you with some ideas on how you may be able to improve. That's it for me. Thanks for stopping by.